G'day, it's Huck. This is something a little bit different for the weekend. I just wanted to introduce you to our new podcast. It's called The Crackling, where we share the stories of Australia's best chefs, butchers, artisans, and pork producers. This is the first episode in the series where we feature Louis Tickeram from Stanley in Brisbane. We'll be releasing new episodes weekly, so search for The Crackling in your favourite podcast app to subscribe. We'll be back with a new episode of Deep in the Weeds on Monday. In the meantime, enjoy the first episode of The Crackling. Probably went for about three or four months where just nothing was going right for me, just nothing. It was just, oh, it was just hell every day. I was just, you know, I was just constantly messing up and burning things and taking too long or, you know, and... um, but that's where I really learnt to, um, to cook. This is The Crackling. I'm Anthony Huckstep. We're not all born with talent. We're not all born with opportunity. But a tenacious, never-say-never spirit can open up many doors and experiences. Louis Tikaram grew up in the New South Wales country town of Mullumbimby. When he turned 18, he took a chance on a gut instinct and it set him on a culinary path he'd never imagined. So, Louis Tickeram, back in Australia, <laughs> mate, after taking LA by storm at EP and LP, what, what brought you back here and well, to Brisbane? Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's kind of, you know, people say I'm back to Australia, but I'm just as shocked. But for me, it's not really back to the area. It's not back to Australia. It's back to the area I kind of grew up, me and my wife, um, you know, when we when I finished school in 2003, the Byron area, it was no... You know, there's a few restaurants, but it was something that, you know, I never thought I'd probably find a career around, you know, when I left. And that's why I just... HSC, pen down. Were you, were you going to be a chef? Or yeah, well, that was kind of... Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I grew up in between... Mullumbimby and Fiji so my <laughs> that's yeah. a big difference <laughs> so my father's Fijian but even more of a twist he's Fijian Chinese Indian so his mum's Fijian Chinese and his father's Fijian Indian wow so growing up in that household you just never knew what was going to be on the dinner table. Was it going to be chicken chop suey and steamed fish ginger and shallot? Or was it going to be goat curry with fresh roti? Or was it going to be polusami with kakonda? You know, so it was always kind of different. And then in Fiji, you know, we didn't have television till 1996. So right. basically you would come home and that was your entertainment. You didn't just veg out on the couch and scroll on the ipad and you know when you were a kid you you went and you helped cook or you helped you so you know, were in the kitchen from an early age yeah, yeah exactly so you know i just love to be with my grandma in the kitchen and watching her cook and watching her put together all the food and then sitting down and talking and eating and sharing and laughing and for hours you was, know and was then, there any dishes you can tell us about like cooking with your grandmother that you know, that have been important to you? Yeah, like definitely like her, you know, like a Fijian chicken curry. So Fijian cuisine, there's the traditional cuisine, but then there's what our families created through this multicultural background where it almost created like a Malaysian style curry because you had the fresh coconut cream in Fiji, but then you had the Indian influence with the dried spices. And like if you talk to a Fijian and you say, oh, like, Fiji chicken curry it's just like this star anise and cassia and curry leaves and coconut and it's a whole kind of genre of cooking this this kind of style of curry so that's definitely like even my wife can cook it as well you know because it's almost like a little rite of passage yeah like if you spend time in Fiji you learn this style of cuisine yeah unreal so you left Mullumbimby so after your HSC yep so while I was in um, school i yeah, I, my, my main goal was and I, I wanted a car. I loved to surf, I loved to hang out and we weren't, you know, growing up, I grew up on kind of on a farm in 110 acres. So just our driveway was a three kilometre dirt road. So 
I'd be riding my bike everywhere and I wanted a car. And so I, there was a kind of rinky-dink old Thai restaurant in town and uh, I went in and I, uh, I wanted, needed a job and they said, yeah, you can wash dishes. You know, so I said, okay, great, perfect, done. And so I started washing dishes at uh, Gecko Thai. And, um, Did you know one, much about Thai food? No, nothing, never, like never, never really. My grandfather, Indian, he called it Thai. So he didn't know much about Thai food. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I didn't know much about Thai. And then so I was washing dishes and it was just a Thai woman and one other guy that helped her in the kitchen. And one day he didn't turn up and I was washing. And then I could see her just going down. And so I went to help her and she was kind of like, oh, wow, you you know a bit about cooking? I was like, yeah, I cook with my grandma a lot. And then she, I'm like, cumin, cumin, you know, turmeric. And she's like... I think she really just saw cheap labour, to be honest. <laughs> she was like, hmm. <laughs> so then she said, I'll find another person. You can start to help me. So straight after school, I'd go, make curry puffs and skewers, and that's where it really started. And then I was pretty much every single weekend and every night after school, I would I would go and, and cook. Um, was that the roots? I mean, you ended up at like long grain well that's is, what yeah well which is an in pretty important restaurant in our culinary history that's when i yeah. kind of fell in love with thai food and even though it was like country thai i i loved it i just loved the aromas and that complexity of flavor and you know we i went out in byron one night um during year 12 i think i just turned 18 and i met a guy at the beach hotel and he was like oh you cook and now we're, i think they just finished work at finn's so that i could tell that were the you know, tattoos and they were kind of the and i was like oh and I started chatting. He's like, "Dude, if you want to, you want to cook Thai food? There's this spot in Sydney. It's just open. It's called Long Grain, and that's like, if you want to know anything about anyone or Thai food, that's where you go." So, I only had that one word in my head. Yeah. And uh, obviously, no one, in, no one, and none of my friends even knew what a restaurant or anything like that. And so that's what I did. My brother lived in. He went to Sydney Uni. HSC pens down. I bought my car, packed it with all my stuff, looked in a revision mirror. My mum's there crying. <laughs> and I said, if it doesn't work, I'll just drive back. Like, it's no biggie. Drove to Sydney, um, turned up at my brother's. He was in Chippendale on Abercrombie Street. Left my car and he said, okay, what's the plan? I'm like, I'm going to go to this spot, long rain tomorrow. And apparently it's like, you know, super cool and I, I want to I wanted work there. And So there wasn't a job going. You just wanted, you wanted a job there. Yeah, I didn't. I'd, I'd never even stepped foot into a restaurant, like a good restaurant, ever. You know, like ever. So this was the whole. And my brother was like, "Great, cool, excellent." So I could. I knew I could walk there, so I, he told me how to get there, and I walked through. You know, this is when Chippendale wasn't a nice suburb. You know, so I walked through Chippendale, the Central, and then went to Surrey Hills, and turned up at this huge, beautiful glass windows. You know, and I walked in and. I still remember exactly, you know, I, it's so vivid in my memory. And I walked in and I said, hi, I'm, uh, can I talk to uh, someone about a job? And she was like, oh, do you have an appointment? Did I know you're coming? And I was like, an appointment? It's a restaurant. Like, what do you, what do you mean, like an appointment? You know, make food. And uh, Marty came out and I could just still, he was, must have been cleaning crab and he had his tea towel over and he was like, what? And I was like, oh, I was just wondering if there's a um, possible for um, to you know, like work here as a as a chef. And he was like, no, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, now, uh, and so I kind of just his if you know Marty, his face. I wasn't going to argue with this guy, so I was like, okay. So I left, and I, I went back to my brothers, and he said, oh, how was it? And I said, oh, didn't go kind of how I planned. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'll just go back tomorrow. So I went back the next day. Pretty much exactly the same thing happened. And I went home and he asked me again. I told him and he's like, well, you don't, you're not going to stay on my couch forever. So you better <laughs> sort it out. So I said, I'm going to go back tomorrow. And then I went back the next day and uh, same thing. And he just said, oh, you're a persistent little fucker, aren't you? <laughs> and then from that day on, I, he took me in and he showed me a room, which is about the same size as this, kind of like, five meters by three meters and there was a, a meat grinder and a coffee grinder <laughs> and it's that's all i saw for the next year so i just ground curry paste and spices 
every day, day in, day out, from seven in the morning till six at night. Well, it's aromatic, if nothing else. <laughs> so, so I went home the first couple of days, and I woke up, and my uniform wasn't at my brother's, and then I kind of looked out the back into the courtyard, and it was all on the courtyard out the window from the two-story <laughs> terrace. And he's like, it stinks. It stinks of garlic and onion. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so that's what I did. So I just, I just worked at Long Island. Marty bought me my first chef jacket, my, my knife. I didn't have anything, you know. I didn't even know you needed these things to work in a restaurant. So he really took me under his wing. And, uh, yeah, just, I, I, I put away deliveries, strained all the stocks, pressed the pork hock, made curry paste, ground spice, and that, that was it. That was well, that my pork hock was pretty significant dish you know under long grain and, and, and its sort of celebration yeah. as a restaurant you know like how many did you do there i mean what what was involved in that dish? oh we do we well we used to do we used to do four trays of pork ox so five times six it was 30 hocks in each tray so we braised them in a really beautiful aromatic master stock for about four hours and then we deboned the hock and then checked it for bones and then kept the skin completely intact and then pressed them in trays kind of in the vice versa so they almost like locked in yeah and then would put you know it would have been at least easily 100 kilos and then press them down for 24 hours and then pop them out and then cube them and then that was the dish yeah so and that would be four trays so you know 100 hawks every day um, seven days a week. <laughs> so was there one person on that section? <laughs> yeah, <much>. me <laughs> plus Carapaz. Plus, <laughs> so it was like a real, it was a real rude awakening, you know, to to what hospitality was, and you know, if oh my god, we work with this French guy, and he if he found a bone, because then I would do all the base, you know, and then they would just come and it's all ready, and um, if he found a bone in the pork, oh, oh my god, Lord have mercy, I was in like <laughs> oh. I'd just be screamed at for so long, a because it could have damaged his knife, and b just because I was the uh, I was the uh, punching bag of the kitchen. So long grain is uh, is interesting in your career, given that that's almost a starting point. Yeah, certainly in a big time restaurant. You left, and you you gained some serious street cred with other places. Yeah, you know, like Bentley, Tetsuya's, and then you ended up coming. Coming back round to Long Grain and yeah. you know, winning Young Chef of the Year and yeah. um, and running the restaurant. Yeah, it was quite amazing. It was uh, you know like I I owe Marty you know everything you know if it wasn't for him I just don't know how my life would have uh, you know played out if he didn't accept me that day you know could I could be a completely you know could have lived a completely different life. So we always kept in touch you know through all the different restaurants I worked at and then I ventured overseas and I worked in, you know, in Southamptons and Canada and travelled through Scandinavia and Europe and back down into Southeast Asia and that whole trip was about expanding my repertoire and my horizon of, of food because I fell in love with this, with Thai cooking and I was obsessed with it but then I didn't want to sell myself short I wanted to experience all different types of cuisines so I traveled through Turkey and Egypt and you know Europe and Spain and Portugal and Scandinavia and hoping that I would kind of find that kind of fire in my belly for a different cuisine as well other than Asian but and I thought I did when I traveled through Italy and it was like amazing and the, the you know the Naples and the pizza and the cheese and you know like and then it was so cool and then I kind of traveled I went to Egypt and then from Egypt I got a cheap flight from Cairo to Bangkok and I kind of got off the plane in Bangkok and just instantly that humidity and plastic furniture and grilling meats and fish sauce and sometime and then I was like oh, who am I kidding this is this is it. You know? I'm sold. I want to. <laughs> yeah. I want to go there now. Yeah. So that's when, in the end, so I and, and that's and then I flew f back home after Southeast Asia, and uh, I landed in Sydney. I think it was a, I got an early flight, and I landed, and I was staying with my auntie in Potts Point, and then I kind of like had a little nap and got up and went downstairs, out onto kind of Maclay Street, and I wanted to get a coffee, and then 
Who do I see? First, first person. Why the fuck haven't you called me? I'm like, Marty, I just got back. Literally, I just got back, you know. And he's like, oh, okay, what do you want to do? You want to get tea or something later? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. He's like, meet me at Long Grain. And so we got to Long Grain, literally just landed, and he was in a hard hat. And it was when the whole... <laughs> Marty boats in a hard hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I didn't know what I was in for, actually. It <laughs> sounds more like YMCA. <laughs> And that was the the renovations of, of Long Rain, you know, 10 years on and they took over the downstairs and they created the canteen and and he was like, wow, what do you, you know, we did a big walkthrough and he said, what do you think? And I said, man, it's, it's awesome, like it's great, it's like a whole nother rebirthing of Long Rain, I think it's great. And he goes, no, what do you, th- what do you think? Like, you want to run it? So here I was, like I built my reputation out, like I went Long Rain, then Bentley, then Tets. And, Which you know. are very different to Long Rain. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you need tweezers in some of that. Yeah. You like, <laughs> like Brent Savage, Tetsuya, amazing yeah. chefs, amazing cuisine, yeah. but very, big detail. Very, yeah. So I, I've always been a bit of a sucker for punishment, just chucking myself into the deep end. Um, yeah, and that's kind of how it all kind of un, unraveled, you know, and I just, when I went travelling, I kind of thought, Am I going to just throw all this away? Like the, all the kind of how hard I've worked to get to these restaurants and then just chuck it away to, to go backpacking kind of thing. And I didn't know what my future was when I landed back in Sydney. I didn't know if I would have had to start again from the bottom and, and do it all again. But just like that first day I walked into Long Range kind of six years earlier, it all, you know, it just all kind of unfolded. And when within the end of the day, I was a... Uh, I was running the joint, you know, and I left it as a second year apprentice, you know. So that's pretty frightening yeah, to nature's amazing. little guy tapping on the door <laughs> to running it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like this fire in your belly to sort of jump in the deep end and just, you know, go for it without sort of knowing what you're getting yourself into. Is that what lured you to LA? Like yeah. that, that sort of a challenge? Yeah, it was because yeah. I mean they I guess you got to give them an experience of Australian cuisine with Asian influences and all of your rich history that you'd built up that yeah. maybe they hadn't seen before. No, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and another that was another amazing experience of, um, you know, an individual just trusting me and being like, okay, if that's, if that's what you want to do, let's, let's just do it. So, yeah, I, um, I, I went to LA and completely different restaurant, completely different concept, completely different food, completely different style of service, completely different flavours, you know, not even for the customer, but also for the the cooks that were yeah. preparing the food, you know, like n- no server or cook or anyone had used lemongrass, turmeric, coriander, you know, like... Yeah. Dried, Which we kind of take for granted. Yeah, yeah. It's, for us, it's on every kind of tre- streets corner. And that's kind of what I explained to them. I said, this is... This is our Mexican. So imagine, you know, every corner, everything, there's, there's a little Mexican, there's something. This is what, this is our influence in Australia. It's kind of Southeast Asian. Yeah, so LA was a very, it was a, it was a, it was a really cool story, really cool, you know, and that's what I was doing. I was telling basically a story of my life, you know, the cuisine that inspired me, the place that I had worked and the places that I've travelled. Was there a dish that you couldn't take off the menu over there that some people sort of got um, that, that you kind of was important to you? Or? Yeah, like, you know, I, I think a really big one was, there was a couple. Um, one was Coconda, which is a Fijian-style ceviche with fresh-squeezed coconut cream um, and sea grapes and cherry tomatoes and it was a very it was a dish that I've probably the earliest dish I ever learned to cook with my grandmother and because of that link to Mexican cuisine you know yeah, I sure. think that was always a good segue into the American palate and the American way of thinking if they can compare it to something that they knew they'd give it a whirl yeah so it was a like Fiji and ceviche you know and then I was like wow this is really cool it's like a ceviche but that richness of the coconut cream really makes it you know quite special so that was a you know that was a great dish um a a dan dan noodle um with pork neck which was really awesome with a lot of szechuan and you know they they knew that kind of typical chinese cuisine but then when i started delving into a little bit more 
complex flavors of Chinese, they could still understand the food and yeah. and relate to it quite well. And dandan noodles, that's a cracking dish. It's so like good. I try and make it at home and <laughs> it's not a bad version. Yeah, but yeah, But like, yeah. I don't do pork neck and I'll have to steal your recipe. It's yeah, no, good. it's just perfect. Yeah, like pork neck, you just dice pork neck and then just saute it and then just like work it into the Szechuan sauce and over top of the noodles. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, so, you know, it's cool. Like, yeah, eat, uh, EP really... Um, you know, it almost changed, you know, a whole city's kind of eating habits and, you know, it didn't kick off, you know, straight away, but I just kind of stuck to it and I wasn't going to move over to the other side of the world and not cook the food that I want to cook. I was happy at Long Grain, you know, I would just happily just, you know, because I was able to cook the food that I love to eat. So yeah. I wasn't going to change it and um, kind of got to, a point where it was like, well, you know, it it hasn't really taken off yet, and but I I I wanted to just stick to my guns, and and then finally it started to started to gain some traction, and then it really just went like gangbusters. Well, yeah, I mean, you were huge. The restaurant was huge, and that surprises me that you came back and you came to Brisbane, <laughs> <laughs> which I've got to concede from a food point of view. It's changed dramatically in the last yeah, couple of years. Yeah. yeah. But what, what lured you here? Like? Um, my good friend, uh, Jonathan Barthelmus. He, uh, he's he, got Greco. And he's got Greco and Yoko, Yoko which is yep. right next door. And you the know, Apollo in Sydney. Apollo yeah. and Churcho. And so he's, he's always been a really good friend and someone that I really trust uh, their opinion. You know, not only in food, though in restaurant scene and business as well and uh, he came for his 40th birthday actually and celebrated at EP and he's originally from Burley and um, you know he's like Louie man like I know you're from you know like Mullumbimby and you know Brisbane's like it's going off <laughs> and I was like really and he's like yeah he's like you know you could you could possibly even like live around Mullum and still just you know commute or you know you know your parents are still there and yeah, just it never really occurred to me that I could have the best of both worlds. I could be around the area that I grew up and around my family and also work at a great restaurant. So, Did you ever envisage doing Cantonese? Yes, well, you know, it was always, A, it's, uh, you know, one of my favourite foods to eat, you know. I feel just stemming from those kind of meals that my grandmother used to cook me and her father had one of the first Cantonese restaurants in, in Fiji, right. the Canton Cafe in Suva on Mark Street. And then together with, you know, that kind of uh, rite of passage of going to Golden Century for the first time, being a young cook in Sydney and eating like the live seafood and the pippies and exo and you know, it's a very nostalgic uh, cuisine, I think, to, to any chef that came up in Sydney. And um, Brisbane just doesn't have any, you know, just didn't have anything like it. And yeah. I always wanted to continue to grow and to develop my skills. You know, that's why I really love hospitality because it's an industry where we don't stop learning and growing. And I always wanted to um, to keep kind of expanding my repertoire and my reputation of the food that I wanted to cook I never wanted to be painted into the corner of being oh he's a he's a Southeast Asian guy he he oh we can't really have him there he just only does Southeast Asians where I wanted yeah. to make sure that you know I'm 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 kind of expanding and uh able to to adapt to all different types of cuisines yeah was well, so Stanley's got like lots of classic Cantonese dishes I mean what's your approach here like are you doing modern twists so like how, how do you approach doing something like that i mean it's a huge restaurant as well it's a like, big restaurant and i suppose from when i got back to brisbane my style or my approach to the menu changed drastically because i um i don't know if it's because i was away for so long or I never cooked in Queensland, but the produce is just, it's still, I, I just, it's like pinch yourself moments, like just the seafood coming in and the, the vegetables from these small Asian markets and 
the beef and the pork I mean just from a few hours away and you know getting direct with the with the farm or the or the farmer and and uh just a the the kind of like limited amount of hands that passes through yeah. you know it's still like a like a kind of a country town in some sense of dealing with these suppliers and so you know Cantonese food is such a perfect cuisine to just showcase good produce showcase steam fish showcase local bugs showcase harvey based scallops malula bar prawns gundawindi pork stockyard beef you know it's just it's all from around here yeah and there's all these little asian growers and i'm i'm using these smaller guys and they're just sending me a picture of a a plot of gailan saying is this the size you want it <laughs> and i'm like yeah that yeah that's good and he's like great i'll just take i'll take you know stan we'll just take that plot so the farmer's happy because he's sold the whole plot he doesn't have to wheel and deal his guy line at the markets and things where he's just gonna you know harvest it and send it to my guy and my guy's just gonna bring it to me so do you see that as a something happening in the brisbane brisbane scene or is it more australia and that's how it's changed since you've been gone and there's more sort of linking to quality produce and and connection with farmers yeah like definitely it's a i met this i met a fisherman chris bolton you know from from far north queensland and uh you know, he was on this seesaw where, you know, the fishing industry was going one way where it was just going big and trawling and and to, to kind of keep afloat, that was the way you had to go because, you know, this small kind of wheeling dealing wasn't really working and then he kind of said that he turned a corner and went, hey, how about if I just supplied the best quality fish that I can possibly supply just to just a few people not on that large scale and he just couldn't believe it saved his whole business family and whole career because that and then it just took off you know and it was like and now i just get i get fish sent directly you know from him exactly the way he's packed the box and and it's it's uh it's it's still like a pinch yourself moment when you eat that coral trout it's like something that I'd never tasted before in my life like the, the the amount of care and and the, the amazing thing in brisbane people they're buying it you know and i think like brisbane clientele are so patriotic that if it's a local farmer or a local fisherman uh, you know they're willing to pay you know and they know i'm not getting it for cheap and then they're not getting it for cheap either but they're supporting the local kind of industry which is pretty amazing so like Brisbane's just been a whole uh, bunch of surprises so far. Hey, you sure. sound like an apprentice, like you just started cooking again. You're like full of like, oh, like it's just, eyes wide open. Yeah, it's like, it's amazing. What is it about working in this industry that you know that you love? Like, um, I just you know like I I know it sounds kind of corny, but just like doing what you love, you know, every day. It's it's just uh, I feel you know often I just feel very selfish because there's not a lot of people that you know are really truly you know so passionate and then love what they do every day and you know get off on kind of ingredients that they're cooking or a customer's reaction or 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 you know just how grateful people are for, for good food and you know i really uh kind of appreciate it a lot for doing this uh, it sounds like you've had a pretty stellar career and you have and a lot of drive behind it, but there's got to be some pretty me- big mess ups along the way, <laughs> like where you've uh, been yelled at at head chefs and stuff like that. Like, have you ever ruined a service, or you got some funny stories behind that? Probably, it was probably when I went to Bentley, <laughs> <laughs> and you could probably imagine <laughs> a guy that just rolled in off the street from Mullumbimby, no training, no nothing, only knew lemongrass and lime leaf, only knew how to cut angel hair as fine as possible, then go into a kind of under a chef like like Brent Savage, who's yeah. got a quite a already a um quite unique style of cooking and to go into a team of four guys, lunch and dinner, you know, doubles every day and um you know four people in the kitchen cooking you know degustation there's not much room for for 
training wheels. Right. And that kitchen was tiny. The kitchen like the was original tiny, Bentley. Yeah. And I kind of told him a porcupine as well. I told him I was a fully qualified chef when I'd only been cooking for two years. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew like he didn't want to um, – I knew that he didn't really want to hire, you know, any apprentices. I think he was just looking for, like, the real deal. You know, there was Dan Hong, Dave Vahul, um, myself, and Brent, you know. So it was already a bit of um, – there was a bit of talent in the kitchen already. And so I just told him, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm qualified. I'm, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm ready, ready to roll whenever you need me. And he used to come into Long Grain a lot, and that's how we met. So when he opened Bentley, he, um, <clears throat> he said, oh, if you want a job, come up. And I said, okay. But I was still kind of uh, tied into a, uh, a, a, a um, hospitality placement kind of apprenticeship <laughs> thing. So I just kind of like winged it. I went and I started and I was kind of cooking. And, um, yeah, one day the, the, the woman walked into the, uh, to the restaurant and she said, oh, just – was looking for you at Long Grain, but they told me you didn't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and all I heard was Louis, <laughs> and I went out. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, <laughs> why are you? But then you know, like Brent said, no, he's working as you know, he's fulfilling all his duties as a you know, as a fully qualified chef. So I got signed off, you know, of my apprenticeship. So what's he like to work for? Because he's such a nice guy. Oh, is he is he a oh, brute in the kitchen? Those those days, yeah. So I was, you know, obviously I was way over my head you know and um it just it went, probably went for about three or four months where just nothing was going right for me just nothing it was just oh it was just hell every day I was just you know I was just constantly messing up and burning things and taking too long or you know and um but that's where I really learned to um to cook you know that's where I really you know it was just you know there's so much responsibility on you and so much pressure and that's where I really turned a corner in being able to to, to stay composed and to just push through and to really um I suppose that kind of satisfaction as well from from kind of growing and learning and and uh and then finally mastering a a technique or a section because yeah, Brent was you know, he was it was quite hard, you know, and he had a lot of pressure on him as well, you know. It was like we opened up, we got two hats, we got best new restaurant, you know. It was it was a lot, you know. So he was kind of under the microscope, and it just showed me that that passion and that drive that Brent had as well. That really to kind of blow all expectations out of the water by just keeping your head down and just working and, and letting that passion kind of speak for itself. You don't have to, you know, come in guns blazing and, and being, you can let your food do the talking and that's really like what Brent did in those early days of, of Bentley, which was really cool. But Has there been a moment when you realised, yeah, I, I'm good at this? Well, that's kind of, yeah, when I, when I, that, that's a, it's a funny thing you say that because that was, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't the best at school and I, I didn't, you know, there wasn't much I was kind of good at or there wasn't a very clear uh, outcome for, for when I was in those late teens. And I think my parents might have been a little bit worried, but, you know, they've always stuck by me, but then when I started cooking, I was like, oh, wow, I think, yeah, this is, I think this is something I can do because I, I enjoy it, I love it, um, I'm good at it. And I think that's when, I think at long reign, when Marty started just piling more and more kind of pressure on me when I was only about 19. Like he took me to, long, uh, to Melbourne to open up long reign Melbourne right. instead of like all the different head chefs and sous chefs he took me. Um, and that's when I really learned, and he, and he kind of said, I, I, I'm taking you because I trust your palate, you know, so when I'm doing other things, you can make sure that things are tasting, you know, correctly. And that was from him kind of making nam gins from scratch and, and balancing these flavors that you would never normally think would possibly become a kind of a harmonious flavor, you know, straight lime juice, straight fish sauce coriander roots chili 
and palm sugar. How do, how do you make that taste good? It's just these five like crazy ingredients, you know? Absolutely, and, but they're wild together when, yeah. it's, when it's when right. it's right. Yeah, when it's right. So that's kind of, he honed that, those skills into me at quite a young age and now um, I really enjoy teaching that to younger to younger guys as well, like letting them finally balance and, and train their palate to pick up on different flavors. Cool. Can we go down into the kitchen? Have a look at yeah, what Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'd love yeah, to uh, see, see you in action. <laughs> Maybe eat some food too. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, absolutely. This is the crackling. So how do you feel like when you get in the kitchen? Like how does it make you feel working as a chef? Well, I really, yeah, it's like, you know, some people like, oh, how do you do, you know, like it's long hours or it's, you know, it's hard. But to be honest, I love it's kind of funny. I love to be here, the, f- the first person as well. I just enjoy the kind of serenity of the kitchen and getting a coffee, and yeah. it's pretty amazing here. It h- puts a whole nother spin on it well, at to, Stanley because. And also, can, to be fair, it's a pretty good kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> like, you got the Brisbane River just You've got there. The river at the front. I can have a coffee there and just have a thing and it's come in and it's all green marble and brass and yeah, and it, it almost honestly it feels like a a sense of achievement every time I come in here where it's like, wow, look at look at this environment. I've, you know, really I feel like I've earned to work here and I've earned to, to kind of have this as a, a place that I call my kitchen. So, yeah, it's, every, every day it's, uh, it's like a, a reward, I suppose, when I come into the kitchen and then to have, you know, to be able to train guys and to, to teach them, like I said before, like some a skill set that they will, you know, take for them for, for the rest of their career, just as I was taught. Yeah. And the the possibilities are, are limitless for them, you know. So it's cool to see people just at the start of their kind of amazing journey. That, that totally. And got. you've been talking about the influence of Marty Boats and Brent Savage, you know, all these different things you've done in your career, but now you're the mentor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's kind of cool, the the, uh, the apprentice becoming the master. Yeah, I think but everyone, cool. it is a bit cool. I mean, you guys are wearing jeans these days. <laughs> like, how was it back in the day when you were an apprentice? What were it you was, wearing then? It was very different, you know, like Marty, it was, and that's where I really learned to be very particular, you know, working for Marty. And it wasn't, only in the food, for in a sense, it was I was with the dustpan and brew, you know, dusting the cigarette butts from around the trees on the street, or, or making sure the glass was clean. So it was quite amazing. I only ever worked for chef owners, Brent, Tetsuya, Marty, when Sam, Nick, you know. So this kind of uh, sense of pride inside and outside of the kitchen was you know was huge for me and making sure that staff were well looked after the restaurant and equipment and you know everything was really well looked after and it's something that I'm trying to kind of instill into these young young cooks as well that you know people are looking for the the whole package when they're looking for for a chef for sure so Pork is pretty integral in uh, Cantonese cuisine. There's yeah. Some classic dishes, and you're doing some classics here. Yeah, yeah. So can, can we run through, like, the crispy pork belly? Yeah, it's, so it's like this what? is a dish that, you know, it's it was kind of... My grandma used to cook it a, a lot. Um, my grand-grandfather was a, it was a very... Uh, suyuk was a very uh, important part, because the pork in Fiji is is very good. Like, it's, it's very, really, really beautiful pork. There's wild boar as well, but plus the... The um, the pork is uh, very very nice. I think it's the humidity. It's my kind of. Uh, you so know, does that make take. you fussy with the sort of producer that you use here and like the sort of pork that you're looking for? Yeah, well, I really like the, you know the pork in Fiji. It's very subtle. Um, I think, which is a, a massive, uh, you know, kind of must when I think when you're roasting soup because it's it's got it's not masked in anything. It's not marinated. You know, it's just simply um, we blanch the the belly and then we spike it um and then we rub salt into the skin and then dry it for a couple of days right and then is it uncovered uncovered yeah so we actually have fans in our cool rooms to uh help dry out the the picking dark and the pork and then we roast it on a super high heat covered in salt to help create an even layer on the top and then to 
perfect and amazing kind of crispy crackling on top. Well, that's what everyone wants to know how to do, right? <laughs> I mean, the crackling is like so the gold. Of exactly. So it is, you know, I think anyone at home who really wants to, it's like you can either blanch the pork or steam the pork, but then it's all about spiking it like several thousands of times um, and then working in salt into the skin itself and letting it dry out. And, and then drying it out is the key. Yes, yeah, big time. And then for even that like classic style roast pork, and then you can just roast it as you normally would. And then in like Southeast Asian, we would actually create a slurry with vinegar and salt and work that into the skin and dry it out as well to just give it a little bit more crunch. So that's a that's a pretty nice big piece of pork. Maybe. Yeah. What, so what this sort of is, size pigs are you using? This is Borodale pork. So this comes... Um, it's pretty. It's farm pretty close. Um, I really enjoy the uh, the flavour and the texture of Borodale. Uh, these are these are pretty big. Uh, I think they're like one hundred and fifty to two hundred kg. Um, you know, when they're all broken down. So yeah, it's a uh, it's really great. We use the same um, pork neck uh, for our chasu. Yeah, nice. So this is a little bit more. Um, involved preparation it's a, a few days um, so we cure it first mainly in salt and sugar and uh, five spice um, that goes for kind of a couple of hours we cure it and then we take it out of the cure give it a rinse and then we marinate it in that iridescent red that you would always see in the classic Chinese barbecue yeah. uh, where the red comes from the fermented bean curd and there's rose wine in there, hoisin, um, and some uh, tobinyan, some bean paste. And then we let that cure, uh, like marinate and cure for another kind of two to three days. And then give it a rinse and then sit, and then uh, roast it on kind of 160 yeah, for a ten, kind of 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And just keep basting it in honey, in a honey maltose. And then it's kind of all ready for ready for service. And so then, how long are you hanging it up here for? Um, this will kind of do, we'll get it to kind of almost where we want and it will be, it, it cooks quite quickly due to the cure and the marinade. But then we're just kind of like alternating it in the oven, in and out of the oven, glazing it till it's ready to serve. So we'll get it to kind of like 95% of where we want to serve it and yep. then to water we'll reflash it and re-glaze it and re-serve it and then serve it kind of with a nice kind of roasted eschalot garlic chili five spice kind of sauce as well beautiful why that cut why is it the neck uh the neck's like the neck i think is you know it's one of the most kind of underutilized cuts in pork i think it's just so amazing that the different muscle and fat kind of groups within the neck just make it perfect for chassis where it's you know it's tender it's kind of chunky and then and, and this mix of fat and, and different kind of lean parts of the neck it's like so good and that's it's my favorite cut for curry as well for sure like an awesome like green curry or even like a, a indian style curry yeah yeah the pork neck you just cook it to that like perfect kind of perfection of just kind of over but not too far and it's just like melt in the mouth yeah it's really good no chasu is amazing but i think you know, we've skipped past. I want to know a secret to getting the crackling <laughs> right on this pork, roast pork belly. That's the question on everyone's lips, isn't yeah. it? Always. That's like probably a number one question kind of being asked for. So you probably don't want to give away your secrets, but is there, is no, there something, that you, something that's uh, vital? Um, I think really, yeah, I think kind of that... That two-stage cooking, I think, is really important. I know it's really difficult when people try and perfect a crackling at home just from kind of a, a pork belly that they're either going to roll or yeah. or just roast straight up where you're just using 100% kind of dry heat. Um, I think that kind of Asian style of either steaming or blanching before with the spike method yeah. and working in salt to that skin and like it's really like it's not just you're kind of you know massaging it. in a bit yeah you really you really have to work it in almost till you be it becomes kind of slimy 
from working wow. the salt okay. into the fat and then it creating almost like a like a sludge almost and then and then drying it out and then if you roast it like that just as you would on kind of like 220 yep um you know I just think, to start with 220 yeah and then you can then drop it down drop to it like down. 180 160 and then to kind of achieve that perfect like but it's nice with kind of sometimes when you do it just straight dry heat it's crunchy but almost too crunchy yeah where if you do the kind of double cook with the spiking it's crunchy but like a honeycomb almost like a like yeah like glass yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to eat some now right <laughs> i'm a bit of a sucker for for uh for crackling as well yeah well i, I often cook pork for big groups just because i want to eat as much crackling yeah. as possible <laughs> i might have to use your tips <laughs> Okay, so um, I guess the next thing is, is um, can, can we try some of this? Yeah, yeah. So let's just check here, this, guys. Yeah, so you can see this is like as part of the process. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Yeah, you get with that salt, you get a really nice even coat. And I think what's nice about and it is you haven't scored it. You know, no. like traditionally, like, you know, where you see a lot of people scoring the pork. Too. Yeah, and you kind of ruin that... Um, ruining that kind of perfect it's like classy isn't it even so this you can see if we just continued to roast it it would all you'd dry up all just just like this part here so it's still got a little little ways to go on the top but you can see it's starting to to come in and as it cools it'll crunch up as well is that also what happens when it yeah. cools, the cr- that's yeah, when the crunch well, comes along. Yeah, well, kind of, ex- ex- uh, you know, just like any kind of cooking with any fat or any oil, as the oil cools and solidifies. Yeah, look at that. So how do you serve this? Just like so. We just do it in straight cubes and just with some um, English mustard and hoisin. English and it's mustard? Just that, yeah. <laughs> From you know, it's from the. That's why you know Cantonese is quite such a such a cool <laughs> kind of cuisine as well because it's you know like all great cuisine, it's influenced by different you know like uh, you know t- kind of multicultural backgrounds and totally invasions when trade opened up. and yeah, <laughs> you exactly. know, normally it's kind of you know like a bit of suspect background, but yeah, the, when the uh, in Hong Kong with with the colonial. Uh, you know, migration there, and that's a kind of this beautiful building as well we're standing in, Stanley, that great old colonial style. Totally. You know, it was like it was meant to be a, a Cantonese restaurant. You, know? you, could, you could be anywhere but Brisbane, actually. It's uh, you amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's like unbelievable. Should we try some? Yeah, so try this kind of corn of it. It'll be... I might have to loosen my belt buckle, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, lucky it's in all the way in Brisbane, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so... Although you can get cheap flights these days. <laughs> I know. <Yeah. laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's unreal. So you do also a, a classic suburban Australian dish. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sweet and sour pork. Even in, even in Mullumbimby, we had a, you know, we had a Far East local Chinese restaurant. And, um, yeah, like, like what I was talking about, you know, just finding this really great kind of really great produce, really awesome suppliers, and then, you know, not, not having to do a modern twist or not having to do fusion, you know, we can just do these really great classic dishes that have been around for so long that everyone's familiar with, though just do the best version anyone's ever had and that's always been a kind of a a challenge to me you know I I did it when I went to the states you know in the top of the restaurant I wanted to do this kind of cool street food snack you know like with the cocktails and things but being in West Hollywood it it wasn't the you know people didn't gravitate to it as you would you know somewhere in you know Sydney or Melbourne or but I didn't you know you know like kick up a stink and be be angry and go oh they don't know what they're talking about I said well what, what do they eat so I just did a bit of a kind of 
you know, reconnaissance around and seeing and people were eating, you know, like one thing I always saw was like a chicken sandwich, you know, and I was like, okay, I'll just make the best fucking chicken sandwich <laughs> that these guys have ever had. So we brine the chicken in like an aromatic brine of Szechuan and star anise, cassia bark and did an awesome like gluten-free, like super amazing crust that stayed crunchy for days and a spicy mayo and things. And, and you know, in the first weekend, I think we sold like, 300 of them you know and it's just like it's just i just love that about cooking it's like giving the customers what they want but just giving them the best possible one they've ever had and you don't have to change your style or or kind of sell out as they would it's like no you just take it as a challenge and be like all right you suckers want to eat chicken sandwich all right try this you know and then people would it became like a cult yeah people were coming for the chicken sandwich to eat the chicken sandwich you know so and that's kind of like what we've tried to create with you know we've got mongolian lamb ribs and sweet and sour pork and kung pao chicken uh, and just doing these really cool classic dishes but with great produce well that that sweet and sour pork when when i ate here a couple of months ago like that reminded me of my youth <laughs> and it didn't feel any different but it just <laughs> ate a lot better <laughs> it ate like my um fond memories rather than what i was actually <laughs> eating, I think. but um can you run us through that process because it was it's actually quite light yeah you know and um you enjoy like good pieces of pork in yeah there as well. yeah like it's not just all batter no no you know, absolutely and, so but, um and it's just like capsicum and, and pineapple right? capsicum and pineapple and yeah. some white onion you know yeah. classic so yeah so um yeah the the batter was you know the, we really worked on that for a few weeks of trying rice flour tapioca starch glutinous rice flour corn starch potato starch kuzu starch you know just like <laughs> all these different because you know it always it's just about these different kind of variations or techniques or kind of ratios and i literally after about three weeks we finally kind of were just sold on a like a, a corn starch batter it it kind of it it fried the best but then stayed super fluffy and light yeah but then it absorbed the sauce but didn't go soggy yeah so it was just it was like a, a certain kind of method um to that and just using really good again really good quality pork neck cooking a, a awesome kind of sweet and sour that we kind of cook over a long period of time to infuse a lot of the capsicum mm. and pineapple into the sauce itself along with then the kind of the chunks in the in the in the stir fry itself so well that's one of the beauties of it it's like it's rich with the sauce but it's not a big gluggy sauce because no. it's all caught on the yeah, pieces yeah yeah like, yeah yeah so and it's kind of like Oh, sweet and sour. So that's a that's an easy one. Tick it off. But it was actually one of the more involved <laughs> dishes that really kind of tested us to create this kind of uh, awesome version of it. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, you know sometimes you know it's kind of like like you know lots of Asian cooking. The simple dishes are the ones you can really mess up. You know, rather than the complex ones with all the different pastes and stir fries and marinades. They're the ones that you can kind of tweak a lot and, and, and perfect where it's those ones that just have two or three ingredients that they're, they're really transparent and if you mess one of those processes up or one of the ingredients it's it's very easy to kind of see well uh louis i'm gonna have a another piece of this <laughs> but um mate it's been unreal thanks for letting us be in your oh, kitchen of course no it's great I'm glad and, to um, share it i think uh that uh, crackling's calling me so. <laughs> thanks mate you're welcome thank you this is The Crackling, a Deep in the Weeds production in partnership with Porkstar. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we catch up with some of Australia's best chefs and pork producers to discover what makes Australian pork so special.